Well, good morning. Welcome on uh, this uh, sunny day. <laughs> the ushers are just going to help us just by receiving your offerings just as we begin. So thank you to them and also to you for your constant generosity to us. Uh, we're starting a new series today. It's page 124 in your journal. Uh, we're running this series for the next six weeks where we're going to engage with a series of letters that Paul wrote to a church in a place called Corinth midway through the first Christian century. This series of of letters are our kind of exchange of communications between this apostle Paul and a church that he planted. It seems as best as we can understand that they wrote to him with a list of questions. Basically, they're, they're amongst the first generation of Christians. This is the world that Christianity started in, perhaps the first one of the first churches ever. And they write to this apostle with a various, it seems this various list of questions that they have about how you be church. This was new. Nobody had done this before. So how do you figure a lot of this sort of stuff out? And Paul then writes back to them in a letter that we know as 1 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians in your New Testament. And then it seems at some point they've written back to Paul with a series of follow-up questions to which he then has written back to them. So you're getting this backwards and forwards of letters going on. We want to spend a little bit of time engaging with these texts. And of course, there's a question then. So what are these texts from somewhere around about 2,000 years ago, written to the first generation of Christians? What do they have to do with us here in the so-called first world? Uh, you know, 20, 21st century people reading ancient texts. What does it got to do with us? Hopefully, what you'll find as we work our way through this series that these texts speak to us even today. I want to encourage you to do a little bit of homework. If you haven't read the Corinthian letters before, then this would be a great time to do that. If you have read them before, read them again. It's a great thing about the Bible, you're allowed to read it twice. <laughs> and, uh, and I encourage you to read these letters, bring them back to your familiarity. They are old, they're from a few thousand years ago. As you read them, there will be challenges that you think, I'm not sure we have that problem today. There'll be elements of them will be quite shocking. Some of the language you'll think, oh, I'm not sure we would say that like that today. But also what you'll probably find as you read them is you'll realize that people are people and we haven't changed much over the past few thousand years. And the problems we struggle with and the issues, maybe the issues come in slightly different different form, but the same issues are still human issues. And so we read this letter from the first apostle to one of the first churches, and we realize that there's a reason why churches for the last 2,000 years have been reading Corinthians, because it says a lot to us. So there's your homework for the next few weeks. It'll probably take you about an hour to read slowly through both the Corinthian letters in the New Testament. So that's like one episode of Netflix, right? <laughs> One of the difficulties of reading the Corinthian letters, and actually this is true of all of the New Testament letters, it's a little like going through someone else's mail, right? Where you realize some stuff's gone on and there's some, been some talking backwards and forwards. And, you know, now we are reading one side of the conversation. So we're kind of sometimes having to guess, and you'll find this as you read your way through these letters, you're kind of sometimes having to guess, I wonder what they asked in order for Paul to respond this way. And you're trying to imagine the kind of question that they want. I sometimes find myself wondering, and I'm not trying to make any deep theological comments here about the nature of scripture, but I sometimes wonder if what Paul would do if he was with us today. Like, you know, did he, when he was writing to this church in Corinth, think, yeah, 2,000 years from now, in Calgary, which he wouldn't know where that was, there's going to be a group of people in the 21st century sitting down going, let's spend six weeks talking about this letter that he was writing. Like, I don't know that he could have imagined that. Worse than that, imagine you were the church in Corinth. They were a messed up group of people, right? You're going to find as you read the letter that they probably didn't want us knowing them for the things that Paul wrote to them about. Paul says things like, you guys are arguing a lot. Well, that's okay. You're, you're actually suing each other in court. Okay, well, we still do that today. Uh, they, they have doctrinal problems. Uh, again, that's uh, fair. Um, they also have these issues where there's some sort of inequality going on in their community. That, that It seems that the early Christians used to meet together and eat together a lot. And it seems that some of the people who were wealthier were eating all the food. So when the poor people came, there wasn't any food. And it seems that some of the poor people have died as a result of this. So that's kind of embarrassing. And then Paul says, 
for the rich people. It's worse than that for the poor people. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then Paul says that their sexual moralities are so bad that even pagans would be embarrassed by them. You're right. And here we are 2,000 years later, and this is how we know them. <laughs> you know, like maybe Corinth would be like, what we really should have done is when we got that letter, we should have read it and shredded it. <laughs> because 2,000 years later, they're still talking about us with all of our disastrous stuff. For us to see these letters give us an insight into a little tension-filled moment in the world of the first Christians. But what I'm hoping is as we read these letters of this little moment in the world of the first Christians, they speak to our first world. They speak to us here today and the sort of problems that we find ourselves doing. So you're going to have to use your creative imagination a little bit sometimes. Richard Hayes, the New Testament scholar, says we have to draw imaginative analogies. Their problems might be framed slightly differently than ours. Like Paul, at one point, he talks about whether or not you're allowed to eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol at the temple which is probably not a problem you've encountered this week. You know, uh, you know some of you are like, well, I, I was at the food court in the mall. Uh, <laughs> you know, it feels like a temple and I definitely sacrificed. Uh, <laughs> but we look at one problem, we might find ourselves saying, well, that problem there is a little bit like a problem that we suffer from today. So we're going to be doing some looking for the overlaps as to where their problems, distance as they are from ours, actually speak to us and help us shape our way around. The Corinthian scholar Anthony Thistleton, as he's listing through some of the problems about Corinth, says this. Here are some issues in Corinth. They had issues of status inequality. They had issues of religious pluralism. They had issues around immigration and trade. They had problems about the priority of their market forces. They had an emphasis on honor, fame, and public recognition. So like that sounds like totally not relevant to us at all, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure we're not gonna find a lot to relate to. Thistleton continues, the self-sufficient, self-congratulatory culture of Corinth, coupled with an obsession about peer group prestige, success in competition, their devaluing of tradition and universals, and near contempt for those without status, provides an embarrassingly close model of a postmodern context for the gospel in our own times, even given the huge historical differences and distances in so many other respects. They may have lived a long time ago in a place far from here, but actually their problems are so remarkably similar to the problems that we struggle with today. But of course, there's a question you're all asking. Like, where in the world is Corinth? Right? We're talking about this place I've never even heard of. it. definitely never been on my holidays. And... Uh, and I'm Googling it as you speak, David, and I don't see where it is that I can go on my holidays. If we first encounter Corinth in the Bible in Acts chapter 18, when Paul visits for about 18 months and plants a church there. He arrives in this town and he sets up a church that's one of the earliest sort of church plants that we have now in Scripture. In Paul's time... Corinth, Corinth had been an ancient city, but it got destroyed by, a, by a, a group of people some time back. And by the time Paul arrived, it had only been rebuilt by the Romans for just over a century. So it was a new place. One scholar described Corinth's establishment somewhat similar to San Francisco during the gold rush. He said it was a wide open boom town. So a century or just over a century old by the time Paul writes to it where huge prosperity had been happening. The culture in Corinth was one of upward social mobility, prosperity, self-sufficiency, built on a model of trade, business, entrepreneurial pragmatism in the pursuit of success. But once again, like we can't relate to that, can we? This city from the olden times speaks so closely to us and where we're going today. So it's a kind of invitation for you to think Corinth and Calgary all at the same time. Here's a map. On the right-hand side of this map, you have what we would uh, see of Israel curving its way up round into modern-day Turkey, uh, which you may have heard of or not. On the left-hand side of the map, you can see the boot of Italy. And right there in the middle, where is modern-day Greece, is where Corinth is found. A Roman city in the middle of Greece that sat on this really important trade route between the east and west of the Roman Empire. Basically, everything that was traveling from one side to the other in the Roman Empire went through Corinth. The reason is this. Just at the bottom of that pink circle on your screen at the minute is the bottom end of Greece. If you wanted to move trade from one side of the empire to the other, you had to do it on a boat. Sailors who picked up the job of sailing around the bottom of Greece were told simply this, forget about home. 
Such was the death rate amongst sailors sailing around the bottom of Greece because it was so treacherously bad waters to sail in that most regularly your, your chances of sailing past there was that you would die. We even find in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when Paul is sailing past this place at one point, what happens? The ship hits a storm and they end up shipwrecked. So it's even in the Bible that this is a bad place to sail by. The solution to this is Corinth. Because Corinth founds itself inland in this little sort of peninsula uh, kind of spot where it's actually divided, the whole sea is divided by six kilometers of land. So sailors discovered that a better thing to do than die was, was sail down this little bit of calm water to Corinth, offload all of, your, all of your supplies and trade that you've got on your ship, drag it the six kilometers across the road to the other side of the, uh, of the, of the land and reload it onto a different ship to send it across the rest of the empire. Everybody lives, nobody dies. Success, right? What this means is that Corinth becomes the place through which everything that's moving in the empire passes. All of the bad stuff and all of the good stuff. <laughs> One ancient writer coined a phrase to Corinthianize, which basically meant that you were so devoid of any moral stature at all, right? <laughs> because basically in Corinth, if it was going on, it was going on in Corinth. But the good side of that was every good idea went through Corinth as well. You could influence the whole world from Corinth. The ideas of Athens where the philosophers would think up new things, only spread around the world if they got to Corinth. And Paul plants a church there. By random, by accident, or maybe by strategy, that if you can put a church in Corinth, if anywhere in the world is gonna spread the gospel, it'll be from Corinth. Because as tradespeople, as travelers are passing through, trying to avoid certain death around the bottom of Greece, what they hear is also the certain life of the gospel. And perhaps this is why Paul is so concerned that this Corinthian church represent the gospel well. Because the type of Christianity that happens in Corinth will be the type of Christianity that happens elsewhere. Because their form of Christianity, their way of working out the gospel, will be the type that gets on the boats, that will move its way across the empire, spreading the news of Jesus. Just think about this. As best as we know, the Corinthian church that Paul writes to is at most 100 people, probably less than that, scattered across a couple of households in this ancient city called Corinth. And yet they're so positioned in the world that actually they're able from those handful of people, they're able to spread the gospel throughout the empire. Maybe this is why Paul gives them two letters. Maybe this is why Paul is so interested that they follow Jesus in a good and honorable way. So when we dive into the letter, and we're going to do a little bit of reading round uh, through in this kind of opening session of the series. So follow me on the screens or with your Bible if you want Paul opens the letter, after he said hello, he begins his conversation like this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> like, you're like, oh, okay, what a way to start a letter to a group of Christians, because we all know that you put three Christians in a room and you get four opinions. And Paul writes, quite lightly, opens his line with, why don't you all agree? <laughs> why don't you all just be in one mind? My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels amongst you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul. And another says, I follow Apollos. And another, I follow Cephas. And another still, I follow Christ. Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, you might know him better as Peter, are kind of key figures in the early Christian movement. And it seems like there's some sort of factional thing going on in this sort of society where uh, some people like different ones better than the others. And then there's some spiritual guy who's saying, well, well I, I actually follow Jesus, uh, me. Um, Paul continues, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. 
what you'll see at the start of this letter is that Paul is concerned about unity. He's concerned about the togetherness of this Christian community. What you'll actually see as you read your way through the letters is that's the thread that holds all the arguments together. Paul talks about a lot of apparently random stuff in Corinth, but if you look closely, you'll notice that he's concerned about unity. The message of the church to the world has to begin in a place of unity. It has to begin in a place of togetherness. But how does that work? Because you see, Corinth was a society that was obsessed with fame and status. And it seems like they've become affected by this fame and status obsession of their wider society. So even within the church, these factions have started to develop. Arguments over which leader they like the best. In Paul's time, people in church had preferences over which pastor they liked better than the other pastor. In Paul's time. <laughs> so Paul reminds them, that it wasn't their status that brought them to Christ. It wasn't, it wasn't who they were when they found Jesus. That made, Now, we do know that one of the Corinthian people were actually quite wealthy. There's a road in Corinth which is labeled as being built by a man called Erastus, who we know was part of the Corinthian church. So some of them did have serious wealth. Some of them did have noble status and high position. But most of them were probably kind of freed slaves or perhaps even still slaves or poor people from from within society, this kind of hodgepodge of demographics from all over the place. And Paul reminds them that they may live in a society that's obsessed with status and wealth, but that's not how they found Jesus, that that's not how they got into the church. And this speaks to us today because we know a little bit about status and fame. Children today grow up wanting to be famous. You ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? Famous. Nobody knows what they're going to do to be famous. We just live in a society that knows that if you're successful, everybody else should know about it. doesn't matter what your success is. We live dreaming for that tweet or that post that goes viral. If you had a viral tweet that the whole world would read it, that would be amazing. Although, of course, it doesn't always work out well. You remember the guy that shot Cecil the lion? <laughs> you know... <laughs> Sometimes you don't want everyone to know what's going on. Fame might not be quite as good as we remember it. But Paul responds to Corinth like this in chapter 3. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul. I sometimes wonder if I should ask myself this question on a daily basis. Before you head out into your day where people will make assessments of you based on their perception of your status, I like you, I don't like you, I value you, I don't value you, maybe we should stand in the mirror and go, what is David? <laughs> like, you know, not some deep postmodern question, <laughs> but a question about where I find myself in the world. Paul answers it like this, only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building like you know people have favorite pastors people have favorite worship leaders people have favorite songs for some reason they always seem to be from hundreds of years ago <laughs> people people have favorites that's okay okay we're not you know that's just how we're wired as humans some people pastor in a way that helps better than other people pastoring you individually some people talk some people sing some people hug in different ways and we appreciate that the problem paul says is when we forget that we're all building together something that one person's doing one task and another person's doing another task and we're all coming together to do this together and if we're not careful we start valuing the person that planted more than the person that watered and we forget that actually what we're supposed to be doing is following god because it's him that's doing it in our heart Sometimes it's easy to say, I've grown so much under that pastor or that ministry or that church. And what Paul's trying to point out is actually it's only because God's there that you're really growing. Because everything else is just kind of transitional. But God's the one who's changing things. People leave, people join. Churches across the Western world have huge turmoil when they change pastoral staff. And that should worry us because it suggests what are we actually doing here? Are we here to let God grow us or are we here just pursuing celebrity and our culture unity in contrast 
calls us to work together. The church that Paul imagines in Corinth is a church that's working together to do what God has called them to do, build God's house, create God's building, be God's field. Unity calls us to work together, whether it's a building project that we're working on or whether it's how we care for the poor or the elderly or the broken or the downtrodden. Unity says we come together in this, not to follow after a particular one person or another, but to follow Jesus. And this is the core of Paul's gospel which he explains to the Corinthians in chapter two. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. See, Corinth was a world where the the, the entertainment in Corinth wasn't the movie theater or a band, it was public speakers. Corinth had this great tradition of bringing in incredible public speakers who would come and they would talk. Sometimes they would just tell stories. Sometimes they would talk politics. Sometimes they would work you through history or philosophy, but they had to be good speakers. They had to be interesting to listen to. And people would flock to listen to whoever the great speaker was. Paul says, when I came, you know, nobody knew who I was. Nobody flocked around to hear this great speaker. Paul says his speaking wasn't that great. He wasn't particularly impressive. Paul couldn't string a phrase in the way that some of these impressive speakers could. Paul says the only reason that you found anything that I said important, worth listening to, was because it was about Jesus. Because it was a message about Christ, Jesus, and him crucified. And our lives as Christians should be shaped and formed by the gospel that talks about a Jesus that was crucified, a gospel that talks about Christ on a cross, not by just clever sounding ideas. You see, because the thing about unity is that we're all bound together in the church, in Corinth and in Calgary, we're bound together by the same thing, that we all came through the same door. No matter your background, no matter where you've come from, the first step for all of us is the same. It's Jesus. This has been a core component of Westside King's Church for a long time, that we believe that the first step is a low step because it's a step that everybody's got to be able to make. No matter where you come from, the confession that I believe that Jesus was crucified to save us all is the confession that starts the journey of following Jesus. And the church tries to work that story out on a regular basis because we all came in the same way. We work this out the same way and we keep the cross as central in our story of the gospel because that's what reminds us that we all came through the same door. That's what reminds us that we all needed the same Jesus. And that shapes us and calls us into the way that we should go about living. Jürgen Maltmann, the German theologian, says it like this, the inner criterion of whether or not Christian theology is Christian lies in the crucified Christ. Then he quotes Martin Luther's famous Latin phrase, crux probat omnia, the cross is the test of everything. Within Christianity, if it's not about the cross, if it's not being shaped by the cross, if it's not the low first step that all of us come to Jesus the same way, it might be a lot of things, but one thing it's not is Christian. And Christianity stops talking about the leveling power of God's cross, the leveling power of a cross that called all of us. It's no longer Christian. And the cross was a real event. This is important. The cross was real. It happened in history at a physical moment on a particular day. It's not some spiritual happening that happened in some other world, but it happened here. Because you see, Christianity is not a spiritual movement that's just about something going on inside us. Christianity is about something real. Remember, just a moment ago, we came around these communion tables and we didn't do something spiritual. We did something physical. We took food and we took fluid because they're real. And it reminds us that Jesus' death was real. That might do something spiritually. That might change something in our very spirits, but it's also changing who we are physically. So the gospel about Jesus crucified should make real world differences. It should change us. It should shape us. It should form us in particular ways. And maybe that's why the cross is so significant. This one event in history, an image of shame that becomes the means by which God both invades his world and conquers sin, but also the means by which this God draws us into relationship with him. We're invited by this method of the cross. 
no matter who we are, to follow Jesus. Which might make sense of why Paul can't understand why the Corinthians are so obsessed with status and fame and getting into these factions. Because if we all came in through the same door, if we all follow the same Jesus, if we all confess the same cross, why does that stuff start mattering again once we're in? Why do we insist on kind of bringing this back, this worldly notion that these things matter? We try and reestablish them after the cross. So think about the communion that we just shared in. Think about what we just did. At some level, it's a test of the cross. If it's not open, open to everyone, if we put standards on it, Bob said it when he invited us to take communion, the only confession that matters is that we confess Jesus as Lord. No matter where we came from, no matter what our background was, no matter what your personal worries are at this exact moment, you came to the same table with everybody else in the room. If you think about the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul takes us through the communion meal, and by the way, the reason many of us Christians continue to do this on a regular basis is because of these letters to Corinth. But when Paul takes us through it, he says what we're doing is we're proclaiming the Lord's death. How does a meal proclaim the Lord's death? Well, if the Lord's death, this shame-filled death on a cross that opens the door for everyone is the message of the gospel, when we have a table that's open for everyone, that no matter who you are or what your background is, you can come and eat from it, can you see that this equality of the table matches the equality of the cross? And they're brought together. So every time we do this, we announce the unity of the church. We announce the togetherness of the church. It says that this is the core of who we are as God's people. When we don't do that, or when we do the opposite, it doesn't announce the gospel like Corinth, it just announces that we're not really different from the rest of society. So the communion table reminds us how to live. It reminds us how to work our way through things. And that's why Paul perhaps picks it up in chapter 11 of his letter to them. In the following directives, he says in verse 17, I have no praise for you. And a real gift with encouragement, Paul did. Uh, I never was brave enough to write this on any of my students' papers. Um, even though it was a biblical studies program, I felt like it would be funny, but I worried they wouldn't get the joke. Uh, for your meetings do more harm than good. And I know some of you are like, yeah, I've been to some of those meetings. <laughs> In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. This is another word for communion or Eucharist. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? The unity that binds us all together is that we all come through the same door. And while Corinth had lots of crazy stuff going on, as you'll learn as we work our time in this series, Paul zeroes in on this particular issue. Hunger and drunkenness around the communion table. Some people are getting there early. One of my students did a big piece of work some years ago in Corinth and pointed out that in the social structure of this economy, the people who could get there early would likely be the wealthier people because they had control over their own lives. So they're getting there early, going, wow, look at all this great food, and they're eating up and just enjoying themselves. The poorer people who would have less control over their own lives, perhaps even be slaves, by the time they arrive, there's actually no food left. Paul says at one point that some of your community have even died. Is it possible that they've died because they were so hungry because the Christian church was the only place that they could come for sustenance and food. And yet other people are turning up thinking this is just a great party and they're overeating and over drinking. Perhaps the church is trying to change something in Corinth and because people are living their own lives selfishly, that's not working. But think of the take home in this passage here. If there's inequality around the communion table, it's just a meal, it's not the Lord's Supper. If there's inequality around the communion table, it despises the church. That hurts a little bit. Like you read that and you go, ouch. Like if there's inequality when we take communion, something's going wrong. Let me explain it like this. Here's a quote that I don't agree with from a professor that's not me. Um, <laughs> 
David Harvey, Harvey uh, writes and lectures on postmodernism uh, down in the States. He says this about cities in the postmodern context. What kind of city we wish to build should reflect our personal wishes and needs. And that's pretty much about the most postmodern thing you'll read today. <laughs> it's all about me, right? It's all about what I want, and I'll work and do towards making sure that everything reflects my wishes and needs. Harvey argues that in postmodernity, we need to distinguish how we talk about cities into two categories, hard cities and soft cities. The hard city is actually the same place as the soft city. It's all about how we relate to it. So Calgary as a hard city would be explained like this. The geographical boundaries, the buildings, the makeup, the terrain, the history of Calgary are its hard stats and factors. That's just what it is. Calgary is in a particular place. Everybody that comes to Calgary finds it in the same place. They find the geographical boundaries in the same place. It is what it is. But the soft city is how we experience Calgary. It's how it feels when we move into it. And that experience is different for every single person that comes here. Think about the factors that can affect you as you drive through our city. Your wealth will affect what you see. The attractiveness of particular areas and whether you live in them will be affected by your standards and history and experiences. Your health will affect how you, how you move through this particular, what you see. For what one person can see a city and say, wow, what an amazing city full of opportunities, you can probably find another person in the very same part of town that sees it as exactly the opposite, as a site of pain and anguish and difficulty. Just imagine the difference of experiencing Calgary as an immigrant versus someone who's lived here your whole life, as a successful business person versus an asylum seeker. What does Calgary feel like? It feels different to all of those people. And this creates a highly individual, self-centered approach to how we do life. Because we only ever see our cities through our own eyes, and if we only ever think to see them through our own eyes, we imagine that that's what the city is like. Now think about this in related to the church. There's a hard West Side King's Church. It's an old curling rink at the bottom of 69th Street in Southwest Calgary. That's pretty much factual. You go to Google Maps, that's the picture you see. That's what all of us experience. We all come in and go, well, that's a strange floor. We all come in and go, what a weird shaped building. Some people don't even come in because they go, that surely can't be a church. Look at the shape of it, right? <laughs> Those are hard facts. But think about the soft side of West Side King's Church. We're all here in the same place, in the same building, but every single one of us in this room today have experienced it slightly differently. The worries that we've brought in through the door change the experience that we have today. The friendships that we have, whether you're old or whether you're new, whether you've been here a long time or whether you've just walked in for the first time will change what you feel like. Your financial situation, your life challenges, the relationships you're involved in, all of these things ensure that every single person who's ever walked in through these doors has actually experienced a different church than you have. Their experience changes. Think of, think of how that affects us. Then we go back to Corinth. Here we have a group of people where some people are going hungry while the others are getting drunk. You see, because the challenge to unity, the challenge for us being God's people and being together in unity is always one of obliviousness. Because if we're oblivious to the experiences that other people are going through, if we're oblivious to what it's like to be someone else here, you can arrive at the communion table and eat all the food as they were doing in Corinth because you're not worried about what else is happening on. Here's the rub. Like Harvey said about cities, I think is often what we're trying to do as a church, that we're wanting a church that reflects our per personal wishes and needs. We want the church that suits what we're looking for. That's been Corinth's challenge, and it's probably been every church since then's challenge, that we fight this drive within us to get what we want, when actually Paul's calling these people to open their eyes and look a bit wider, say that Jesus calls us to unity, Jesus calls us to concern, Jesus calls us to care, Jesus calls us to carry one another. And if we're constantly just thinking about our own personal wishes and needs, unity is hugely difficult. Unity is almost impossible, actually, if that's the way that we come about things. And the church then starts to simply reflect our culture and not Christ crucified. Fleming Rutledge in her wonderful book on crucifixion says this, Paul's purpose in the Corinthian letters is to recapture the cross in all its scandal and paradox as the indispensable cornerstone of Christian proclamation. Taking up 
the cross, as Jesus himself called us to do, means a total reorientation of the self towards the way of Christ. That's why Corinth are in such a mess. Because if you try and work out being Christian and still being the sort of self-centered sort of what am I trying to get out of this type person, then what happens is you don't end up building a church. You just end up building a club that reflects the society that you're part of. But Paul calls us through the gospel of the crucified Jesus to total reorientation, to a complete change of a way of being that says if the gospel's true and the cross is real, then how we live is going to be hugely different. And that's going to begin by how we behave to each other in this room, brothers and sisters in Christ. Requires us to convert our imagination, to see things bigger, to see things differently than perhaps we have in the past. But it also calls us into this unified encounter. Sometimes around the communion table, sometimes around the coffee urn, sometimes just in a conversation where we come together and say we're all in this through the same Jesus by the same cross. And this really is what the letter to the Corinthians is all about. And as we journey it through over the next few weeks, hopefully what you'll see is this is why Christians have continued to read these letters for the past few thousand years, because they challenge us at our very core elements of what it is to be human. So there's an invitation in this series, an invitation to journey through Corinth and allow Corinth to journey through us as we reorient who we are in the way of Jesus. My prayer for you is that as we read and study together, God's going to speak to you through it. God's going to speak to me. He's going to speak to us, both as individuals, but also as a community together, as he calls us to be more Jesus-like, more Jesus-shaped, and influence our world. Let me pray for you. Jesus, you call us to be a people of your gospel, of you crucified. And we answer that call, and we come to you. But you also call us to be a people who live your gospel. And that requires us to be in unity. And that's difficult for us, Jesus, because we're naturally selfish, we're naturally proud, we're naturally self-seeking. So God, we invite you as we journey through these letters over the next few weeks, we invite you to help us. Help us to see where Calgary is like Corinth. Help us to see where Westside King's Church is like Corinth. And help us to move into a place of unity, into a people of unity that represent your gospel and your crucifixion, Jesus. So help us, Lord, is our prayer. Amen. Have a great rest of their weekend and may grace and peace be with you.